Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dick Ogren. Uh, I don't use a pulpit. I don't like pulpits. I guess. So I'm going to stand right here. Uh, I had a lot of memories here. Uh, I have some confessions today to begin with. So it's been uh, most of 40 years since. I spent very many Sundays here. And most of the Sundays that I came here, I had a hangover. Some of you may not know that. But uh, it's so good to come here and not be that way anymore. But uh, it's good to see you young people here make good choices. I made a lot of that. And, uh, so anyway, let's get started. Uh, the young man that led the singing, tell me your name. Dustin. Dustin. Uh, I about changed my lesson in this stream or <laughs> you uh, read the scripture in, uh, in Luke or in uh, John, John chapter 14. This was my I might be changing my lesson just over here. But I know that this John 14 was uh, one of my dad's favorite chapters. And uh, one other thing I want to share with you about this part of the book of John is John is, uh, I spent a lot of time reading the book of John because. Uh, I think uh, the book of John was written for me more so than the other three. Uh, there are no parables in the book of John. And uh, the part of John that I like the most uh, is from about part of 13 on through uh, 17. And I'm going to get on to something else, but I want to share this with you real quick. Uh, those books, those chapters in the book of John, and the reason what brought this to my mind is what you read. Uh, these chapters carry a lot of weight. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced being at someone's side when they die. But their words that they speak when they're dying stick with you. They have a tremendous impact. So let these words in John 14, 15, and 16, and 17 have an impact on you because these are living words from dying lips. These words were spoken by Jesus hours before he died before he gave up his life for us. So that's that's what I had to say. That's probably brought to my mind when you read that in John 14. So having said this, I want to continue on this to another uh, in Romans was my lesson for today. Uh, the book of Romans is uh, uh, one of those books that troubled me for a lot of years because it was hard for me to understand. Uh, and then I thought about, I read some things, and I thought about the book of Romans, and Paul wrote uh, letters, different letters to people and to churches, and the Romans were well-educated people. And so Paul wrote according to who he was speaking to. Who he was writing to. So he wrote a letter to the Romans that is far more, you want to say, educated than some of his other writings. And an example that we can use from this is that Romans, the book of Romans, before these schools became so liberal in their thinking, was used by the Harvard Law School and the Yale Law School as a guide to 
teach lawyers how to argue a case. And if you look at the Book of Romans, uh, there are some translations. The one that I like that shows it the most is probably the uh, New American Standard, where the word therefore is used throughout much of the book of Romans. And it's as if Paul is presenting a case. He's arguing a case. And uh, I want to look at part of his uh, his argument, not necessarily argument, but his discourse. In, in, uh, but if you start at the beginning of the chapter and look through Romans 2, 3, 4, 5, you'll see uh, the word therefore or uh, what then. Or what then shall we say? Which is the same way, the same thing as saying, therefore. And, and Paul does this all the time through, these, through this uh, first half of this book. But the one that I want to focus on today uh, is uh, three chapters. But I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm not going to get into everything that's in these three chapters. We'd be here a month. But I want to cover some things. The, in Romans 6, 7, and 8. And uh, before we go, uh, one other thing I want, I want to, to share with you is uh, years ago when uh, my sons were young, I was involved with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes in the town uh, where we lived. And uh, one of the things that we always told the kids was uh, in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. And I want you to be like the Bereans. Now the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word of eagerness, examining the scripture daily to see if these things were so. So I want you to be like the Bereans today examine the scriptures to make sure that what I'm telling you today is true. And that's what we used to tell the kids. Don't just take my word for it. You get this thing right here and make sure that what I'm telling you is the truth. You have an obligation to do that. Alright, so therefore I'm going to continue on here like Paul did. And I want to start in chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? So Paul is going to explain to us what took place when we were baptized. We were buried, therefore, there's that word again, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in this life. So here, here is a, an explanation of what takes place with us, what happens to us when we are immersed. We are buried. We are buried. Our sins are buried. And just as Jesus was, he he died. His life uh, was given up on the cross. Uh, he carried our sins to the cross and uh, was crucified. He was our atonement, uh, our propitiation. I remember my dad using that word. I never understood what it meant at the time, but I do now. Jesus was our sacrifice, our atonement. And then he was buried. So here we are, when we're baptized, we are immersed in water, and we are raised up out of that water, just as Christ was raised from the dead. And he was raised to life, brought back to life. And that's what we are. We were we leave our old self behind in that water. And we're raised up out of that water, we're resurrected. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we might too might walk in this life. 
For if we have been united with him in death like this, we shall surely be united with him in resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. The one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ, or alive to God in Christ Jesus. Well, we have a we have an assurance here because of our commitment to Christ and our baptism. We have an assurance, and uh, we talk about the word hope. And uh, I think about the word hope, and uh, a lot of times it's, we have people have a misconception about that word. Uh, sometimes they equate it with, "Oh boy, I hope I get this for Christmas." That's not what hope is. Hope is a confident expectation. It's not something that we wish for. It's something that is assured. We have a hope in Christ that is concrete. It's, uh, it's confident. And that's what, he, what Paul's talking about here. Uh, so you must also consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. We have that hope in Christ. Uh, the next few verses. There's three things in the next few verses. Uh, there's a declaration, a, a, a decision, and a devotion in the next three verses. Paul does a lot of things in threes. If you, if, when you're reading his gospel, a lot of times he'll, there'll be three things, there'll be three points that he'll make uh, what he's saying. I'm going to read verse 12 uh, through 14. And you see if you can see these three things. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for righteousness. There's a decision. The declaration is the beginning. Do not pre present your members to sin as instruments for righteousness, but present yourselves to God. There's a decision that's made here. You decide to present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And that goes back to what we just talked about, about being raised, about being Christ being resurrected. Uh, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will no longer have been in over you, since you are not your law, but the grace. So, uh, there's that key word right at the end of that. Grace. We are uh, baptized with remission of sins. But that is just one of the ingredients to our salvation. And uh, there's a lot of cooks here today. And I know that if you uh, are making a cake, if you leave out the baking soda, whatever is in that recipe, if you leave one of those ingredients out, it don't turn out right. So that is what, there's an ingredient, there's ingredients to salvation. Baptism is one of them. But it's a very, the very most important thing is what it says right here. For sin will not have dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. And uh, I want to share with you another uh, reading in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 uh, verses 1 through 10. When you were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince and power of the air, that's the devil, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, 
among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and the nature of children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one can boast what we are to work with you, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him, that we should walk in him. So we see that grace saved us. God did the ultimate gift of grace when he let his son die on the cross. And uh, it's not something that we can earn. We cannot do enough to earn this salvation. It's not possible. If we could, then Christ died for nothing. If we could do this on our own, Christ's death was in vain. Moving on down in chapter 7. There's some verses here that, uh, that give me some hope. I hope they do to you too. Uh, uh, when I see Paul speak like this and yeah, know that he had the same problems that I have, it's an assurance to me that I can make it. I can do this. And I want to read to you in uh, chapter 7. And starting about verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I, not, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who sin that dwells within me. So, this verse is telling me that Paul had the same problem I do. I keep doing the things I don't want to do. But I keep trying. And that's what Paul, Paul kept trying. Because he knew that, that God had it. God, God's got it. And God God's got me. Yeah. All right. Now, Paul kind of sums things up in the next chapter. And in the eighth chapter, rule. he tells us all of this about, about baptism. He tells us uh, in the previous chapter, before chapter six, he talks about uh, faith. He talks about uh, Righteousness, and, uh, and then talks about baptism and, and, and love the law and sin. And then in chapter 8, he really puts it to us. He tells us what the rewards are. In the first verse of chapter 8, there is, here's that word again, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Here's that, here's that 
tone of hope again. Well, this is a confident expectation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For the law of the Spirit of life has been set has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So do you suppose this has anything to do with the statement that Jesus made in Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount where He said, I did not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it. And so that's what He says right here. He fulfilled all I can fulfill in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And uh, want to move on down in chapter 8. I especially want to focus on we're going to see a gift of the Holy Spirit here. When, uh, in Acts chapter 2, uh, repent to be baptized. Acts 2 38, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, there's a lot of those gifts. And we're going to see one of them right here in verse 26. Now, a lot of people I've heard I've heard people say this that God will not allow us to be, will not allow things to happen to us that we cannot handle. Well, that's not true. God allows things to happen to us that absolutely overwhelm us. That we think that there's no possible way out of this, there's no end to this. And I've been there. I had things happen to me that just took me right to my knees. And you know, the assurance that we have, what people confuse with that is in and 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 13. Paul writes to Corinthians, he says, uh, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we can see. But I do believe He allows us to be, have things come upon us, events or, or things that happen that absolutely we think are going to destroy us. So what do we do? Right here's the answer. Who does it? Who, who helps us with it? This is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we are. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches hearts knows what is, this, what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to Here's another assurance that we have. That the Holy Spirit will go to bat for us. And when we are overwhelmed with things that take place in our lives that we can't even speak, we don't even know how to go to God. The, inner, the Holy Spirit will intercede with God for us. And he'll, he'll help us through whatever it is that is overtaking us. And we know that those that and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Now, there's a qualifier here. A lot of people just stop reading right there. And we know that all things, we know that for those who love God, all things will work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. So, in order for that to happen, 
we have to be the ones that are called for to the purpose. And that's another assurance that we have, another hope that we have, that God will take care of us. All right, here's my concluding remarks. Last chapter, last part of chapter 8. Starting verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? That's kind of like another therefore. Paul's arguing in case we. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who dies. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And here's the best part right here. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure there's that confident expectation. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's my lesson for you. Paul is a, a presentation of Paul as a lawyer arguing the case. He makes a presentation here for us. 